Francais. Hello, bonjour. We acknowledge that the land on which we gather is a traditional meeting ground and home for many indigenous peoples, including Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, and Nakota Sioux. We are grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are with us today, those who have gone before us and the youth who inspire us. A tradition that dates back centuries, land recognition now calls us to acknowledge that we are Treaty 6 people, to remember our responsibility, to deepen our understanding of the treaty, to participate in and support the ongoing process of truth, reconciliation and healing. Bienvenue, Tawau. Welcome to Westwood, everyone. A special welcome this morning to those who are first time visitors or consider themselves newcomers or are returning after an extended absence. Westwood is a compassionate Unitarian Universalist community where you are welcome to explore your spiritual beliefs and decide for yourself what they may or may not be where you are welcome regardless of your gender, who you love, your wealth, or your education, where reverence for the earth and belief in the dignity of every person inform our ethics, where music is an expression of our joy, worship brings us together to celebrate what is important in our lives, and acts of justice are a symbol of our hope. Westwood is a welcoming, nurturing, and inclusive community where all people are invited to rest, grow, and serve the world. My name is Rebecca Patterson. My pronouns are she and her. Along with other members of our choir, Harmonia, I'm your service leader this week, and I'm glad you joined us here today in person or on Zoom. Our speakers this morning are Terry Sutart and Paige Billings from Out Loud St. Albert. They will tell us about their organization and give us a chance to ask questions. Our accompanist this morning is Julie Forbes. And our multi-platform team is Hannah, Bill, and Lorian. Thank you so much. After the service, we invite you all to stay and visit and chat and discuss any questions you may have. Next week's service is called Winter and Wintering with guest speaker David Bellrose, who will be Zooming in from Ontario. To receive information about our upcoming services and events, please sign the guest book on the table at the back and include your email address, or um, you can also sign up to receive the e-newsletter on our website. Good morning. So this is a poem called The Pride Flame by Linda Lee Franson. We light this flame to ignite hearts and minds, the spark of knowledge that enlightens, the shimmering hope that burns, the blazing love that engulfs our actions, the bonfire of our commitment. We light this flame for those who celebrate themselves, who fear, who hope, who persevere, who stand on the side of love for all. We light this flame for those who have been ridiculed, that they may find peace. For those who have fought to marry, that they may celebrate. For those who live in uncertainty in the world, that they may have hope. We light this flame to renew our commitment, that no one shall ever again suffer for the right to love. We light this flame to celebrate our kaleidoscope of diversity, working, loving, and living on the side of love. For this, we light this flame. The words to our hymns today will be on screen, as well as in the gray and turquoise hymnals. Um, our first hymn is number 305. Please don your masks and join us in singing hymn 305, De Colores.
So now we come to candles of joy and celebration. Candles of joy and concern is a moment in our week that gives us the opportunity to hear and express something important that is going on in our lives and the lives of those around us, to celebrate what brings us joy and to share what is weighing on our hearts. For those of us who are online, please raise your hand so that we can see who would like to speak. You're in, uh, for those in the building, you're invited to come forward and speak, then light your candle as the next person speaks, or to light a candle in silence. We're also happy to bring the microphone to you in your seat if you wish. We'll begin with candles from those of us who are online. Speak now. <laughs> okay, so while people are thinking there, perhaps we'll go on with. Um, I'll ask Rebecca to light one final candle for all those whose joys and concerns remain in our hearts. Please join me for the affirmation. May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. Each week during our Sunday service, we take a few minutes to acknowledge the gifts we both bring to and receive from this compassionate community, gifts of talent, time, and treasure. Today, we're blessed with the musical talent of Julie Forbes and Harmonia, as well as the gifts of time and service from those who plan, greet, coordinate our sound and video systems and clean up after. If you wish to make a gift of treasure, the information for doing so is on the right-hand side of this slide. Please don your masks and join me as we sing, From You I Receive. And now we come to our second hymn. Um, while you have your masks on, please join us. Uh, we're going to sing, We Are a Gentle, Angry People. And please note, we've made, changed the words for one of the verses to include gender diversity. Okay. When I Google prayer for queer kids, the first hit is all sin asking God to force repentance for what I call holiness, for what I call holiness, 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 holiness. And so I yell, I swear and I rage and I feel the heat of fury mixed with protection. I swear I rage and I feel the heat of fury mixed with protection. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. That thing they despise, I call sacred. 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 This being oneself. This being oneself. In a world that suggests repentance with a tone of holier than thou damnation. Nope, not here. Not in this house. Not here. Not in this house. Not in this house. There will be no repenting for the courage to love honestly, for the ways your gender beckons you to bloom. There will be no repenting for the courage to love honestly, for the ways your gender beckons you to bloom. No, this is a prayer for the queer kids. This is a prayer for the queer kids. This is a prayer for the queer kids. This is a prayer for queer kids. A ring of fire. A ring of fire protecting the Eden that exists inside of embodied love. That exists inside of embodied love. Protecting the Eden that exists inside of embodied love. 
in this house. In this house, we speak only of the holiness and existing honestly. In this house, we speak only of the holiness and existing honestly. We speak only of the holiness and existing honestly. In living and loving fully. In living and loving fully. In existing honestly. In living and loving fully. My prayer for queer kids is this. 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 May you find the people who love you fiercely. May you find the people who love you fiercely. May the God of grace fill your lungs with life when people leave you gasping through tears. May you know in your bones that you can never be separated from all that is sacred. May you know in your bones that you can never be separated from all that is sacred. Because it exists inside you. Because it exists inside of you. It exists in every gesture of love you dare to offer the world. In every gesture of love you dare to offer the world. A salve to the soul bruise of anyone who believes they are only somewhat worthy. A salve to the soul bruise of anyone who believes they are only somewhat worthy. An act of holy defiance. Holy defiance. Holy defiance. You, my dear, are glorious. You, my dear, are glorious. You, my dear, are glorious. Just as you are. Just as you are. You, my dear, are glorious. Just as you are. Just as you are. Now and forever. 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 Amen. Now and forever. Amen. Now and forever. Amen. Does anybody else need a Kleenex? <laughs> oh, wow. So um, I'd like to thank Lorian for finding that beautiful video for us. And um, I would like to introduce our speakers. Um, Out Loud St. Albert has been around for a number of years. And um, I have a very tiny connection, and that is that I taught Terry Sutart's um, three uh, children and at Oliver School. And uh, it was very soon after uh, Mia, the oldest, uh, left our school that they started Out Loud St. Albert as a safe place for um, queer young people to gather and, and be. So um, we have Terry Sutart and we have Paige Billings. And uh, please feel free when Paige has finished their talk to um, ask any questions you might have. And uh, I will pass the mic over to Terry. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, so uh, my name is Terry and uh, um, you may wonder why a, a straight white guy would be talking about um, queer things and issues and, and that sort of uh, idea. But um, the truth is my, my kid uh, came out, I've got three daughters, um, and my kid came out uh, just about uh, 12 years ago. She's going to be 24 here shortly. 
And uh, I was raised, or we were all raised in a, in a Catholic church, um, which had its benefits and also had its uh, negative parts as well. So the reason why we started Out Loud is that my daughter uh, Mia came out when she was 12 years old. Um, and she she was having a difficult time, of course, figuring out because um, nobody in our family, we didn't know anybody who was gay. We didn't know anybody who was trans. We didn't know anybody in the community at all. Um, and so, yeah, we were um, going in some some uncharted territory. Uh, and when she came out, um, she came out and, and basically came out to her dog first and then to her mom and then to me. Um, and one of the things that we found was that she... Uh, she didn't have anywhere um, in St. Albert. We live in St. Albert, and there was there was nowhere in St. Albert to go. There was no other queer kids. Um, nobody talked about um, you know gay issues or um, trans folks that were around. And none of that kind of thing was around. Um, and she went to something called Camp Firefly. And hopefully, all of you have heard of Camp Firefly. It's an excellent place, um, you know, and, and they've got. Uh, amazing people, amazing resources, uh, amazing um, support. Uh, the only thing that they don't have is that they have something great that goes on for four days, but then the, the other 361 days, they don't have anything, right? And that was kind of the problem that we had is, is what goes on after these amazing four days and after these kids all meet each other. And, you know, then what do you do? So she said, dad, could we do something, um, you know, to, to help this out? And I said, for sure. So what we did is we decided to get a, a group of kids together, um, actually, oddly enough, in the in the basement of a church, and we had four kids show up, you know, out of all the kids that we had talked to, all of the, the ones in, in high schools and things in, in uh, North Edmonton and, and all of St. Albert, Morinville, that kind of thing, and four kids showed up. And I talked to the other kids and I said, why can't, why don't the rest of you come? And they said, because it's in a church and we're afraid, of course, of the church. Um, which is neither here nor there. It's just their opinion, right? I mean, it, it doesn't, the, even the, uh, at the, at the time we were in a, um, oh, what do you call it? Uh, wasn't he United or it was United, United church. Yeah. Um, and the pastor was a gay guy and, you know, really good, really open, really great with the kids, but they couldn't get past the cross at the front. Right. And so that was, you know, and some of it is, is still true today for, for some of the kids, um, but yeah, what we decided to do was, was have these kids come once a month, um, and just talk, you know, just play some games, just do some fun things. And, uh, so we did that a couple of times at the church and then we decided, oh, maybe we should move this to, to the high school. And then 15 kids came and then 20 kids came. And then over the last, uh, it's going to be nine years here in the spring. Um, we've had to increase everything. So we had to go from one meeting a month to two meetings a month. Then we found out that there was younger kids that were under 12 that needed to come. Um, and, and they were figuring out, you know, what was going on and they were supported by their families. And then there was um, some of us who were in, in a P flag group, which is, uh, it stands for parents and friends of lesbians and gays. So it's not as inclusive as it should be, but it's, it's also almost 50 years old like me. So um, it, it's getting better. Uh, but yeah, that's what we did. And, and it's, it's gone now to, to a place where we've got out loud has its own space. Um, we've got three staff like Paige here. Um, and it's, it's something that, that is, uh, it's, it's amazing. We've, we've had uh, really great, both luck and support, uh, from the community. And, um, yeah, we're just glad to share that with everybody else. Uh, so yeah, that's just a little bit of background on uh, Out Loud and what we do. And then I'll let Paige tell you about, um, you know, some of the more intricacies, um, a little bit better learning from somebody who is part of the, the queer community, because it's really, I'm just an ally. I'm just somebody's dad. So here you go. I'm going to load you up here this way. Okay. Thank you. All right. Get situated here. All right, so first of all, hello everyone. Uh, like the introductions have mentioned, uh, my name is Paige Billings and I am the Outlaw Foundation's newest part-time outreach worker. I am non-binary and my pronouns are they, them. To me, I fall under the transgender umbrella and within it, another smaller umbrella of being non-binary. I don't feel more feminine or more masculine. I feel as though I just exist free of gender. As one of our youths famously puts it, I am just a trench coat full of bees. Um, <laughs> 
I was raised in a Mormon household or Latter-day Saint, as some of you may know it. Because of that, I have actually been giving church talks since I was about three years old. Uh, mind you, it's been about 11 years since I left that church, um, so please forgive me if I'm a little bit rusty. To begin with, I would like to give a little bit of a content warning, as I will be touching on some heavy subjects. Some of these subjects include gun violence, discrimination, oppression, transphobia, homophobia, and politics. So I would like to start with the basics. To begin with, I'd like to discuss what the acronym itself stands for. It is currently 2SLGBTQIA+. The acronym stands for Two-Spirit, Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, Queer, Intersex, and Asexual. These mean the following, in case you don't know. Two-Spirit refers to a person who identifies as having both a masculine and a feminine spirit and is used by some Indigenous people to describe their sexual, gender, and or spiritual identity. A lesbian is a woman who is attracted to other women, to be gay is to be a man attracted to men, and to be bisexual means to be an individual who is attracted to both men and women. To be transgender means to be an individual who identifies as a gender other than the one that was assigned to them at birth. Queer is a word that describes sexual and gender identities other than straight and cisgender. Intersex is a general term used for a variety of situations in which a person is born with reproductive or sexual anatomy that doesn't fit the boxes of male and female. And finally, asexual refers to someone who experiences little to no sexual attraction. I would also like to touch on what the word cisgender means, as I will be using that term throughout my talk as well. Cisgender means to be someone who is co comfortable in the gender that was assigned to them at birth. Through the rest of this talk, I will primarily refer to this acronym as members of the trans and queer community to save myself a bit of a mouthful. If you feel unsure or have questions about my use of the word queer, I am more than happy to delve into that during the Q&A session following my talk. I was asked to speak on some of the more pressing issues that members of the trans and queer community face. And while I could spend hours talking about this, I will try and keep it brief. To begin with, I would like to touch on gun violence, especially in the United States. Statistically speaking, members of the trans and queer community are more than twice as likely to be victims of gun violence than their cisgender straight peers. The massacre at Pulse Nightclub, a predominantly gay bar in Orlando, Florida, was the second worst gun violence attack in American history. This shooting took place on June 12, 2016, so only seven years ago, and left 49 people dead and even more injured, all while trying to peacefully join together and dance. Mid-October 2022, just west of Edmonton in Parkland County, there is an incident in which RCMP were alerted to a severed pig's head in the middle of their pride crosswalk outside of Griminia School. RCMP treated this to be the hate crime that it is, and this happened in Alberta a mere four months ago. Studies show that having one 2SLGBTQIA plus adult in our trans and queer youth's lives reduced suicide rates by over 60%. This is a number that can't be ignored, and we as community members and allies mustn't fail our youth in providing said supports. Another largely pressing issue that members of the trans and queer community face is school violence. I'll be using more statistics to really reflect adequately on how pressing of a matter this is. School violence and discrimination is connected to members of the trans and queer community in the sense that 29% of all transgender youth have been threatened or injured with a weapon while on school property compared to 7% of their cisgender peers. 16% of gay and lesbian youth have been threatened or injured with a weapon on school property compared to another 7% of their cisgender peers. Students who are members of the trans and queer community also face bullying at more than double the rate of others. By this, I mean that 43% of transgender youth have been bullied on school property compared to only 18% of other youth. All bullying is obviously bad, especially 18%, but with a number as large as 43% of trans youth, this is a rate which we can no longer accept and must stand up to defend. Both south of the border and in Canada, people are getting bolder because they are seeing their views reflected in mainstream media. We are seeing a massive increase in hate, receiving targeted attacks on social media, and people are beginning to feel physically unsafe, and that is just within our three-staff office in St. Albert. Hate is becoming normalized, especially when it comes to politicians speaking on 2SLGBTQIA matters.
Part of the hate being normalized includes fear mongering and normalizing misinformation as a tool. When I say using misinformation as a tool, I am talking about rumors of gender reaffirming surgery on children or starting hormone replacement therapy too young. These things do not happen, and despite a limited amount of family doctors that actually see trans and queer clients, the knowledge that they have is there. There's a reason that they are the doctors and not us. There, uh, lastly, the hate is becoming acceptable. It's becoming normalized. It's becoming okay to be openly homophobic and transphobic. Nothing about that is okay, and we need to take the stand to keep our community members safe. Another issue that members of the trans and queer community face is medical care. 2SLGBTQIA plus individuals are far less likely to have a family doctor and are statistically more likely to live with chronic health conditions, poor mental health, and substance use disorders. The pathologization of homosexuality in the 19th century led Western physicians to subject members of the trans and queer community to lobotomies, electric shock therapy, and chemical castration until the 1970s. Homosexuality, including gender dysphoria, was classified in the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of Mental Disorders as a mental disorder until 1973. The AIDS epidemic, which surged in the 1980s, took until 1985 to even be recognized as an epidemic. Then Canadian Prime Minister Brian Mulroney did not even acknowledge the existence of AIDS until 1989, despite being elected in 1984. Two SLGBTQIA plus community members and Canadian researchers had to work to provide people with experimental medications without support from the government. A 1991 survey of all United States medical schools reported a national average of three hours and 26 minutes spent studying the health of homosexual patients. 20 years later, in 2021, a survey of North American medical schools found that the median number of hours spent teaching 2SLGBTQIA plus related content over four years was only five hours. Medical trainees lacked clinical exposure and fewer than 35% of medical schools survey surveyed studied the health of transgender patients at all. A 2016 national survey found that, although 95% of Canadian medical students agreed that healthcare specific to transgender patients was important, fewer than 10% felt that they were sufficiently knowledgeable to provide it. Next, I would like to talk about the number of anti-2SLGBTQIA plus bills that were filed in 2022. 2SLGBTQ IA plus advocates and political experts say the uptick in state bills is less about public sentiment and more about lobbying on behalf of conservative and religious groups. In fact, the slate of legislation includes measures that would restrict 2SLGBTQIA plus people and limit trans people's abilities to play sports, use bathrooms that correspond with their gender identity, and receive gender affirming health care. Five years ago, in 2018, the number of anti-2SLGBTQIA plus bills filed was 41. Comparatively, in 2022, over 238 bills were seen in the first three months of the year alone. A majority of these bills actively target trans youth. Texas Governor Greg Abbott issued a directive requiring child welfare agents to investigate gender-affirming medical procedures as child abuse, which is an order that could strip trans children away from their families. Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin unveiled new guidelines that would make it more difficult for trans youth to change their names and pronouns at school, and that prevents them from using skill school facilities and participating in youth programs that align with their gender identities, such as bathrooms or changing rooms. I think that Alyssa McKenzie, an Orlando-based trans advocate, says it best when they say that, quote, I don't know how to describe to somebody that isn't going through it how it feels to have the anxiety of waking up every morning not knowing whether your state is going to attack your, attack your right to exist, to do all of the things that so many people never ever have to question or think about, end quote. Many states have, on the bright side, increased protection for trans people, passing refugee bills for those seeking medical care outside of their own states, expanding healthcare access, and adopting non-discrimination laws. It is part of a larger pattern. The kind of healthcare someone can access and the education they receive differs drastically depending on where they live. 
When it comes to trans rights, large portions of the South and Midwest are passing more restrictions, while states on the West Coast and in the Northwest have put up more protections. Of the 390 bills introduced in total over the past four years, only 39 of them have actually become law. The most consequential of these bills include sports, education, and ID restrictions, as well as re religious exemption laws and healthcare bans. Many sports bills include not letting youth play on sports teams with the gender they identify as. As far as educational restrictions, K-12 schools have become a new battleground for 2SLGBTQIA plus rights, with lawmakers proposing new restrictions that have a disproportionate impact on trans people. Among them is Florida's parental rights and education law, referred to by its critics as the don't say gay law. The law bars discussion of sexuality and gender from kindergarten through the third grade and restri restricts instruction that is not developmentally appropriate or age appropriate through to the 12th grade. ID restrictions include some states that have moved to restrict trans and non-binary people from aligning or correcting identification documents. Oklahoma banned non-binary gender markers from appearing on birth certificates at all. Other laws, like one in Tennessee, prevent trans people from changing the gender on their birth certificates, which is documentation they may need to get other gender-affirming pieces of identification. Religious exemptions include states that have also passed religious liberty laws in recent years, which gives people and organizations the right to refuse goods, services, or employment to 2SLGBTQIA plus individuals based on religious grounds. Healthcare restrictions are some of the most alarming types of laws to gain ground in the last two years and include gender affirming care restrictions for trans youth. These bills criminalize doctors who provide this form of health care, which can include medical interventions such as hormone therapy or hormone blockers. They could also punish parents for supporting their kids as they seek treatment. Having a younger transgender brother and identifying as trans myself, learning and hearing of these laws and bills was appalling. I did not come out until my mid-20s, however, my little brother came out when he was 16 years old. Had he not been able to access the supports that he did, such as hormone therapy and a trans-inclusive family doctor, I can easily say that he would not be the same person he is today. My own medical intervention as a trans person has been minimal thus far, but I have seen the effects of trans-inclusive healthcare on my little brother, the youth that we serve at Out Loud, and other loved ones in my life. Seeing what a difference it makes in the lives of members of the trans and queer community is, within reason, one of the most wholesome happinesses you can see in the world today. Now to lighten the mood a little bit, I have asked to be... Uh, I have been asked to talk about pronouns. Pronoun usage and awareness is so important, especially to members of the trans and queer community. Having someone ask me what my pronouns are before I have to introduce them myself gives me great joy. That being said, I am also more than happy to introduce myself and my pronouns when meeting new people. So while on the topic of pronouns, there are a few points I'd like to discuss. To begin with, the simplest thing that you can do is, if you don't know, just ask. You can say something along the lines of, hey, what are your pronouns? Or if someone introduces themselves to you using a pronoun that you're unfamiliar with, such as neo-pronouns, you can say something along the lines of, I'm not familiar with those pronouns. They're new to me. Can you help me use them correctly? It may make you uncomfortable, but I can assure you that this will go over well, and whomever it is you may be interacting with will appreciate it so much. Another big thing that you can do is normalize and get used to introducing your pronouns along with your name, even if it is something that you think may be obvious. By normalizing an introduction of pronouns upon meeting new people, you can prove yourself to be an ally by doing something as small as this. Another aspect of pronouns is what to do when you mess up. As a non-binary individual who is primarily feminine presenting, I get misgendered unfortunately frequently. If someone you misgender is comfortable with you, they may say something along the lines of, oh, my pronouns are actually blank. Uh, to receive this news and go about it grace gracefully, what I find is best to do is to acknowledge it, correct yourself, and the most important part, move on. Dwelling on the matter only makes that individual uncomfortable and will usually end up with them apologizing, which is not what we want. And yes, I'm speaking from personal experience. Their correction of you is not a comment against you. However, you must accept the correction. It's harder for people to correct being misgendered than it is to be a cisgender person who corrects themselves. 
One last thing I would like to add on the subject of pronouns is to avoid the phrase preferred pronouns. It is a common misconception that only trans and queer people have pronouns, but in reality, each and every one of us have pronouns that, that we use, hence devaluing the phrase preferred pronouns. I think in some cases, homophobia and transphobia are genuinely about fear. Seeing a queer person live out and proud is triggering to someone who may have been living a small life. You may have spent your whole life according to these rules about gender and sexuality, and seeing someone live freely outside of these norms and rules can unsettle some people. Having been raised Mormon, I probably did a lot of things that I would now frown upon. However, I have learned. I have opened my eyes, ears, and heart to understand this community, and now I find myself a member of that community as well. I understand the fear and the second glances and the whispers. I once did that. I am breathing proof that anyone and everyone can change. Loving everyone is much easier than carrying around hate or resentment in your heart. What if everyone allowed themselves to be free, to wear what they want, love who they want, be whoever it is that they want to be? But instead of introspecting on this, it gets spewed about as hatred because freedom from the lives that people have built their life upon is too frightening to consider. I am here today to ask you to open your mind and your heart. While on the topic of opening your heart, I would like to talk about some ways you can go about being a good ally as I get asked this question all the time. Paige, something happened and I don't know what to do. Luckily, I've brought some answers to this question with me today. To start with, to be an ally means to be vulnerable. Allies need to acknowledge that sometimes they are not going to have all of the answers and that they do not understand the lived experiences of marginalized or oppressed people. This means that it is important to display empathy and not sympathy. When you are the queer, trans, two-spirit, etc. individual experiencing oppression, you don't get to choose to not be in those situations. An ally position is a voluntary thing that you have the privilege of just walking away from. Be that safe person in an instance that a trans or queer individual may feel safe, unsafe in alone. In activist cultures, an ally is a person who belongs to a group which has particular privileges and who works alongside people from groups that are oppressed in relation to that privilege. The hope is to create change and increase social justice in relation to this oppression. It is easy to call yourself an ally, but the label alone isn't enough. Ally is a verb and not a noun. Thoughts and prayers alone, while appreciated and welcomed, are not enough. Oppression doesn't take breaks. It takes all members of society to make true acceptance and respect happen, and your open and consistent support will hopefully lead as an example to others. Lastly, I have been asked to provide some insight on what you as individuals can do to reach out to the 2SLGBTQIA community and reaffirm that you are a safe person to be around. First of all, if I haven't stressed this enough, is be an ally. Listen and really hear what those around you have to say and reflect on their feelings with them. I do normally recommend a flag in the window of some sort, which I did see outside when we arrived here, which was incredible. Um, and that flag can identify that you are a trans and queer inclusive space, whether it's big or small. However, I do want to give a warning that that can occasionally backfire. The pros of having a pride flag up are that it lets people know that you are a safe space they can go to if they are struggling or are in harm's way. Cons include the fact that you may be opening yourself up to more hate, but that is entirely dependent on what your community looks like. For example, at our office in St. Albert, we don't have a pride flag displayed outside in any capacity because it may put us at a higher risk of other non-allies coming in and potentially causing harm. While doing some Google searching, I found an article titled Seven Ways You Can Be a Better 2SLGBTQIA Plus Ally, written by Nicola Carroll, and I would like to briefly go over that article. First on the list is being open to learn, listen, and educate yourself. Part of being supportive means developing a true understanding of how the world views and treats us, as it is not all sunshine and rainbows. Second on the list is check your privilege. Most of us have some, some type of privilege, whether it's racial, class, education, being cisgendered, able-bodied, or straight. Being privileged doesn't mean that you have not had your fair share of struggles in life. It just means that there are some things in life that you won't ever have to think or worry about because of the way that you were born. Understanding your own privileges can help you empathize with marginalized or oppressed groups. The third is to not assume, especially don't assume someone's gender. 
Fourth on the list is to think of ally as an action rather than a label. For example, anti 2 lgbtqia plus comments and jokes are harmful. Stand up and let your friends, family, and coworkers know that as an ally, you find them offensive. Fifth on the list is confront your own prejudices and unconscious bias. Being a better ally means being open to the idea of being wrong sometimes and being willing to work on it. Sixth is know that language matters. We form human connections through language. The majority of us respect when someone changes their nickname. Accommodating trans and queer community members, names and pronouns are no different. Lastly, know that you will mess up sometimes. Breathe, apologize, and ask for guidance. It happens, don't panic. As I mentioned earlier, to handle this situation with grace, I recommend that you acknowledge the mistake, correct yourself, and simply move on. Your commitment to being an ally creates an inclusive environment where 2SLGBTQIA plus individuals will feel safe. I will have a list of these um, these points printed off. They're actually just on the table behind us with the masks when we came in. Uh, feel free to help yourself to those. That's why we brought them. Um, and I know, la sorry, lastly, I know that I have thrown a lot of information at you and I am happy to answer any questions that you may have. I would like to thank you all for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you. And I look forward to your questions if there are any. So yeah, this will segue us into our Q&A. Thank you. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask? Here, I can, I can come down and we can share. Oh, okay. <laughs> thank you. Um, so, um, I know that a lot of the statistics you're telling us that were appalling um, came from the states. And um, I'm wondering what the community is feeling in Canada. Um, are, are, are you feeling threatened by those? Are, are any of those attitudes coming into Canada? That sort of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I would say that they are coming in. Um, a lot of what we're seeing, like I had mentioned, is hatred becoming kind of a, a, an accepted um, thing that people are going about spewing. Um, so I would say that um, while a lot of my statistics were from the States, the statistics of um, school violence and bullying and harassment and all of those things, um, those were statistics from Canada. And because of the hate becoming normalized, it is something that we're seeing a lot more of. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I, I'm wondering why sex is such a topic that we don't talk about. I mean, it's just part of living, isn't it? We talk about eating. We talk about growing up, learning to walk and talk and all the other things. But sex is just something we don't talk about. I wonder. Yeah, so I think to speak on that, that's kind of just ever since I was a kid, even something that was just kind of not really discussed for, for reasons which I'm not entirely sure. It could be the religious upbringing that I had. It was just something that was very taboo, very swept under the rug, all of, all of that kind of stuff. Um, but I, I do think that, um, especially at our space and out loud, it is something that we're kind of trying to normalize the conversations of. Um, we have conversations with our youth when they ask us about it, it's, we don't openly just, hey, we're going to talk about sex. But if kids have questions about it, they do feel safe to come and talk to us. And we're able to provide them the education that they may need that they haven't been receiving. Um, and to also provide them with uh, safe sex materials, such as condoms and dental dams and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, I saw a question over here. Yeah, of course. Hi. Um, one of the things uh, that I found most uh, devastating in terms of statistics from what you said was to do with bullying in schools. And I don't know whether I'm more shocked by the 18% or the 43% of the queer kids. Um, 
and I know we've got gay straight alliances in in very many of our schools here, although they do have to be defended um, at, at times when the prevailing government wants to close them down or out them to their parents or whatever. But I wonder what can be done about bullying because it bullying concerns me such a lot because we require our youth to go to school. They can't stay home and say, I don't like being bullied. They still have to go to school. The only solution is homeschooling and then they don't get socialized at all. They may not get a good education either. So what can we do? What more can we do? Because kids bully other kids. They've always done it. Um, and they don't seem to learn how not to do it. And they don't do it when the teachers are watching. They do it on the way home or on the way there or in recess. What can we do? Great question. Thank you, Cassie. Um, that is something actually that we've seen almost in an increasing manner in our office in St. Albert is um, we do have a couple of uh, youth who are in extenuating circumstances, but who also um, have actually ceased going to school at all. Um, part of that is because of the bullying that they have faced. Um, and I think the importance of having the GSA in schools, um, having that be a safe space. Um, there is a new term as well for GSAs, it's called SOGI. And so that stands for sexual or gender identity. Um, and so that's just a little bit more inclusive uh, for the school boards now. Um, and so I think it's just, it's a matter of having those safe adults in school that that could be the teacher who runs the GSA or the SOGI, um, just knowing that they have safe resources and safe people that they can talk to, um, whether that is within a school, whether that's within a family, whether that's in a community program such as the ones that we offer at OutLoud. Um, there's, there's a whole bunch of different ways that we can see and help and support our youth. And I think a big thing is is seeing them and being able to provide them with that support. Yeah, of course. Um, I think I think one of the uh, things that's very um, uh, controversial and lots of arguments in the community, the broader community, is in terms of trans when medical intervention can happen with kids. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the law in Alberta in terms of what age can they? Can there be medical interventions? You know, I'm yeah. actually not sure on that one. Should I be more on that one? So 16 is basically when it can start. Uh, yeah, 16 is uh, basically when things can start going, but um, you can't actually get any kind of surgery until 18. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Very young children. I think that's where a lot of the hysteria yeah, it never happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The comment was uh, here, I'll pass the mic off to Carl one more time. I think they're in the public. There are a lot of uh, books and there are a lot of um, misinformation that gives you the idea that there are medical interventions at, uh, you know, six, seven, 10 year old kids. And uh, that it's good to hear it. It needs to be stated that that does not happen. Absolutely. And I'm happy to restate the fact that the medical intervention, like Terry had mentioned, it doesn't happen until at least 16 years old. So it's it's never something that our young kiddos are, are facing, luckily. Yeah. Yeah. I know I already asked a question, but I'm I'm curious, um, does does that include hormone interventions? For instance, uh uh little um uh, a person who was a, a boy at birth who identifies at a young age as a girl, um, things like voice changing and, and those other puberty um, changes that the, the child would go through without intervention. Um, I'm just, I'm just wondering about that because I, once the voice is changed, then yeah, it's an excellent question just to see when things can actually start. Um, yeah, and and some of the, the kids that come out to us come out, the youngest one that I've had is four. 
right? And they come out to us, and and this is basically what's um, traditionally known as um, you know somebody who's a tomboy, you know that kind of thing, or or a really um, feminine uh, person, that kind of a thing, just depending on on which gender they were assigned at birth. Um, but the the way that you need to think about this is that um, a trans person is basically someone with um, a male body and a female brain or a female body and a male brain. That, that's that's the, the easiest way, not being a trans person, um, to, to figure that out, right? So I've got friends who, um, you know, some of my friends are left-handed, right? And I'm sure some of you are left-handed. Um, it's just the way things are, right? I mean, we, we don't question about, you know, why am I right-handed and you're left-handed? It's just the way things are, right? So um, when when things start with kids, they don't really get into into hormone therapy and that kind of thing until the puberty stage, right? So so really um, having hormone blockers for an eight year old or something like that um, won't really do anything, right? So it it's got to wait till till puberty is is there's an onset there, um, and the same kind of thing with voice, um, you know something something like voice. Um, uh, training, I guess. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, that doesn't really come into play because there's so many changes that are going on before that anyway, um, that we want to keep those, you know, I mean, if, if it is trans folks that we're working with, um, yeah, for them to not go into a, a higher or a deeper voice or, or whatever they want to avoid. Um, but yeah, all of it does happen, um, you know, around the, the puberty stage. So, you know, we, we only really deal with, uh, in our youth group, um, 13 uh, you know, basically 13 to 18 year olds. Um, and that's when, when that group of, of kids, uh, you know, works on, um, anything that is, you know, more medical or more, uh, you know, things that, that they can, um, adversely affect, I guess. Yeah. But none of it is ev evasive. And of course, all of it is, um, consensual to that, uh, they have to ask for that kind of thing. And then, of course, they need to go through psychiatry and, and get supported by those types of people, professionals. Um, yeah, it can't be just a, a whimsical thing. And uh, one thing that I've actually learned working at Out Loud as well is that um, hormone blockers, if started in a youth who then uh, decides that it's not a route that they no longer want to go down, can stop the hormone blockers, and then puberty would basically just resume as normally scheduled, if you will. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Perfect. I'll pass the mic off. Thank you. So we'll have a moment of silent meditation while the choir assembles for a musical meditation. May the love which overcomes all differences, which heals all wounds, which puts to flight all fears, which reconciles all who are separated, be in us and among us, now and always. By Frederick E. Gillis, which is in our gray songbook. I'd like to say a huge thank you very, very much to Terry and Paige um, for bringing all that information to us and also gracing us with the, the vulnerability of Q&A, which I know can sometimes be um, intimidating. So thank you so very much. Um, we do not have coffee today, but we do have ourselves and our, our friendliness and our togetherness and community. So um, please feel free to stay and um, chat and 
um, chat more with our, our speakers, if that's okay with you. Yeah. So thanks very much for coming. Hopefully next week you can enjoy winter and wintering with David Belrose. And that's it. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Harmonia, for being a team this morning. <laughs>